So we're about to move over to our keynote speaker. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat for the Labour Coast and Country website, uh, and that's essentially so you can at least keep in touch with us. If you sign up to the mailing list, then we'll be able to communicate with you things like uh, the link to the Rutherglen, um, Rutherglen phone bank, uh, campaigning for mid beds for Tamworth, our events at conference, etc. So I'll put that in now, uh, and now I'll hand over to you, Alex, uh, to introduce Lord Manderson and take us off. Thank you. Thank you, Huel, um, and thanks to all of our fantastic uh, candidates from Scotland, Wales, North, South, um, East and West. Uh, my name's um, Alex Mayer, um, and it's a real pleasure to uh, be able to welcome Lord Mandelson to our Labour Coast and Country Conference. Um, obviously, he's a huge uh, figure in the Labour movement, um, but we noticed recently that he was also talking about issues that really mattered to our members here um, in Labour Coast and Country, uh, particularly with a speech back in June, where he made the point, and he was absolutely right about it, that the countryside does not belong to the Conservatives. He's also a man who clearly knows a lot about winning. Uh, back in 1997, we had Labour MPs in over 100 rural or semi-rural seats. And I think we've seen today how important it is that we get all of those people that have just been speaking to us again in rural, semi-rural and coastal seats elected um, as Labour MPs. We're clearly um, on the road um, to start um, making those kind of changes. Uh, we've seen victories in places where Labour has not been doing as well recently. Um, for example, in Selby, which has got uh, large rural um, areas in it. Um, I can see on our call, we've got councillors and parish councillors um, who are winning for Labour in places that have historically uh, been difficult for us. Um, and indeed, we've got uh, Metro mayors like Dan Norris, who represents <laughs> Jacob Reed Rock at the moment. So there really are no no go areas um, for Labour um, as we seek to rebuild trust um, with uh, the British people. We've also heard about uh, the two important by elections that are coming up, and we would definitely um, urge you to get involved with those. Um, the other thing we're going to ask you to do is think about some questions. I know some have been uh, sent in, in advance, and we'd also encourage you to use the chat facility uh, to put some questions to Lord Mandelson, um, and Hewell and the team will be collating those, and then we'll be able uh, to put a selection of those to him. So uh, once again, uh, thank you very much, and I'm really delighted um, to ask uh, Lord Mandelson to address us now. Thank you. Well, Alex, thank you very much indeed and to all of you for inviting me to join you this morning. It's a great pleasure for me to do so, a great privilege for me to do so. Can I first of all um, make two points? One is about Rutherglen. Uh, as Kirsty said, you know, Rutherglen has the potential to be a very, very significant turning point in the Labour Party's fortunes ahead of the next general election. You know, we have a completely intertwined symbiotic relationship between Scotland's uh, fortunes, Scottish Labour's fortunes, and those of the rest of the Labour Party in the UK. Uh, we need each other both to succeed very well. And uh, I was in Rutherglen, knocking on doors for three hours, a very exhausting three hours, uphill and down, down in Rutherglen. Uh, I'm very optimistic. Uh, but, you know, no let up between now and uh, Thursday. Can I secondly say that <clears throat> while we, uh, you know, that we had many strengths and virtues and attributes in the 1990s, in the lead up to the 1997 uh, victory. But if I were to compare candidate for candidate, to be perfectly honest, I think that what we have now in our candidates standing for Labour at the coming election is a breadth, a quality, and a, a depth of ability and talent, which was greater, is greater than it was even in the 1990s. Uh, and that's been brought home to me again, uh, listening to you uh, this morning. So uh, I congratulate you on, you know, your commitment and your hard work. Uh, and we in the rest of the party must make sure that we don't let you down, and we won't. Now, my life in the Labour Party, uh, as you know, has been devoted overwhelmingly to uh, urban and industrial Britain. So you might wonder why I wanted to join you this morning, apart from the fact that I now spend 
uh, uh, quite a lot of my time living on a working farm in Wiltshire? The answer is that I care. I mean, like so many, I love the countryside as do my dogs and Britain's coastal towns more than ever before are sources of energy and well-being in every sense uh, of the term, um, except for one thing. They are a terrible casualty of our failure to invest in and regulate uh, properly our water industry in this country. And that's going to be one of the most chronic and expensive challenges facing the next Labour government. It will it involve very difficult decisions and choices between consumer pricing, shareholder interests, and investment needs. One thing I'm absolutely sure of is that we cannot choose not to choose. A reckoning has now arrived uh, in respect of that industry. But more widely and politically, uh, to be blunt, we have been, we've become too resigned in our party to countryside and coastal constituencies belonging to the Conservative Party. This has to change, and I'll come back to this in a moment. But I want to demonstrate, if I may, Labour's non-urban roots and connection from my own family's uh, history. My grandfather, Herbert Morrison, first as Labour's leader in London, and then as Clement Attlee's deputy prime minister after the war, brought about the creation of the Green Belt. He was very, very proud of this. It was the 1945 Labour government he was part of, which created the national parks and areas of outstanding national beauty. Um, he shaped and piloted the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act through Parliament. Indeed, my grandfather, who was famously known as Mr. London, notably during the Blitz, loved the countryside and cared about the cause so much, he published a pamphlet entitled Labour and the Countryside, and that was a Londoner. Now, his vision was that it should be part of all our lives um, for health and, and enjoyment, um, for employment and as a source of national pride, a place to bring us together uh, as a people. And he was far from alone uh, in the labour movement in the post-war uh, era. And we should aim to rekindle that spirit and those bonds in the 21st century. Uh, as Keir Starmer said to the NFU annual conference a year after he became leader, I want there to be a new relationship between the Labour Party and British farming and between labour and rural communities. To that, I would add coastal towns as well. And I want you to tell me whether you think these relationships are being properly recreated and what more needs to be done. So what's the electoral battleground uh, we face? Polling shows that the rural and coastal vote is up for grabs. The Conservative Party has become disconnected from places which, barring some Liberal Democrat seats and one or two Labour ones, it once automatically elected it. The opportunity, therefore, is there for Labour to win both rural seats and coastal votes in partly urban constituencies surrounded by countryside voters who previously tipped them towards the Conservatives. But to do this, Labour must show it actually wants to win these votes. And this means showing it has sympathy with the fears, the hopes and the needs of non-city people. This is as much a question of getting the tone and the priorities right as it is of offering specific policies that add to its national offer. Labour needs to attract, not antagonise, potential supporters to work with coastal towns and the countryside uh, and semi-rural seats, not do things to them. Now, this is, frankly, not always how Labour thinks. You know, Maria Eagle, I remember, wrote in her 2015 report, for too many Labour members, rurality is synonymous with conservatism. And engaging with these communities is at best an afterthought and at worst a complete waste of 
time. I'm afraid that mindset has not completely disappeared uh, across our party, including some of its higher echelons. Now, most of the needs of rural and coastal people are the same as those of anyone else in Britain. Housing, jobs, control of inflation, an NHS that works, amongst other uh, things, with the additional crisis of sewage along the coast. But most of these people are not rich. You know, they ought to be natural voters for a progressive, modern Labour Party. But until now, they have mostly held back out of a sense that Labour is sort of somehow not for them. Um, and even now in rural areas, it's the Greens in many cases who, are, who have advanced most dramatically, with many ex-Tory voters as well moving to don't know rather than across to Labour. So what might Labour do to take this opportunity? Now, I want to offer you three broad propositions, uh, if I may. One, the first is focus on what matters, notably, not only, but notably housing. Uh, polling for the recent Future Countryside event I attended and spoke at shows that the cost of living crisis and the affordability of housing are the lead issues for rural as well as urban voters. And this would include coastal voters as well. But both fear the impact of uncontrolled development by large profit hunting developers. I mean, 36% of rural voters see this as the top issue against 30% uh, of urban voters. The Conservative failure to resolve these tensions has cost them rural support, and there is no sign of any Tory interest uh, in solving them. A Labour Party that talks about and has plans for specifically rural housing would connect very strongly with rural voters. Appropriate housing policies obviously are needed in coastal towns as well. Now, this means offering a new, uh, offering new affordable houses to rent, as well as new build to buy. In rural areas, current developers are not incentivized to build small developments of well-designed new homes in smaller communities. It should be a presumption in planning that every village in England add a handful of new homes for rent in keeping with uh, local design. The, the Glover Landscape Review in 2019, a key piece of work in my view, which should inform uh, Labour thinking. That proposed a protected landscapes housing association for the 24% of England in uh, areas of uh, outstanding national beauty and the national parks where house prices are unaffordable for those who work in them. The next Labour government, in my view, should aim to implement the many good ideas in the 2006 Affordable Rural Housing Commission, which we, in our government uh, commission, it's been ignored by the Conservatives. Let's go back to the ideas that they advanced. Now, secondly, my second overall point is this, and it's sensitive in a way, and it's don't antagonize rural and coastal coastal voters through tone and tokenism, difficult. Rural voters, for example, even when they agree with Labour's broad policy offer, can sense when they are being offered urban ideas by city people with city beliefs. I mean, I'm, um, you know, summarising to make a point there. Um, but I think you get the sense uh, of, of, of what I'm saying. I mean, Labour in 1945 won with a rural agenda that sought to strengthen the countryside for all the people of Britain. It also spoke directly to the then many rural farm workers, obviously many fewer now uh, in numbers overall, but people, workers, farm workers who voted Labour in large numbers and did indeed elect rural Labour MPs. 
Now, following Keir's appearance at the NFU conference, I think Labour has made good progress in reconnecting with the broad sort of farming community. But most rural voters are not farmers. And rural policy needs to go much more widely. The last Labour government passed the successful Countryside and Rights of Way Act, introducing a, a broad right to roam in, the, in, urban, in open uh, upland areas, as well as the Hunting Act. Now, returning to these issues, and particularly the latter, in my view, is not a priority for voters. 11% say animal welfare is a priority for rural uh, England. And when Labour talks about only 11%, when Labour talks about returning to hunting legislation as an early issue in a parliament, I'm afraid, in my view, it only emphasises that its, its tone, its priorities are not those that matter most to rural voters. You know, housing and cost of living and the sewage crisis uh, on the coast. Those are uppermost uh, in uh, rural and coastal voters' minds. And if we were to sort of go back to this, I think it will risk reinforcing the sense that Labour's approach to the countryside is shaped by an urban mindset, doing things to rural communities rather than with and for them. I think Labour's message of hope and renewal, our ambition to transform the economy and restore public services as well as reinvent them for the 21st century uh, will be as relevant for the country and the coast as it is for the town. But our message will not be heard if rural and coastal people feel we don't get them, we don't understand them, or worse, somehow want to pick a fight uh, with them on old issues. Regarding countryside pursuits, naturally politicians receive calls all the time from pressure groups to take action. And some of these calls may be right, uh, by the way, but governments cannot behave like single issue uh, groups. And if it is wrong, and let's say this very bluntly, if it is wrong for the right wing to stoke culture wars against minorities, it is just as wrong for the left to stoke culture wars against rural minorities. Uh, I think this would feel true even uh, among the majority of rural voters who don't hunt or warm to hunting, for example. They would see it basically as Labour choosing to rerun a conflict which won't actually affect or improve, let alone transform their lives. So stepping back on this and bold commitments on alternative and positive issues such as housing would, I think, underline Labour's new approach. And my third and final point is this, and that is to lead a green revolution in food, farming and nature. Quietly in things from rewilding to nature-friendly farming to the recognition that food production systems are creating a health and obesity uh, a crisis in, the, in our country, radical change for the better is coming to and from the countryside. It's as big a shift as the move to industrial farming after World War II. But it is one on which the Conservatives have, set, have really basically nothing to say. Indeed, the opposite is the resignation from the DEFRA board of the author of the National Food Strategy, uh, Henry Tim, uh, Dimble, to be shown. He just threw up his arms in despair and said, you're not listening, you don't care, it's not worth, worth my wild stay. Now, I think this is rich uh, territory uh, for a modern Labour approach to the countryside and territory the Green Party has to itself too much at present, which I might say policy is widely seen as highly sub suboptimal. Polling for the future countryside conference I spoke to uh, showed 93% of voters think the countryside is part of our national uh, heritage. And 37 picked it as the thing which makes them proud to be British, actually ahead of the armed forces or the BBC. 95% want to see it protected, but only 9% think the Conservative Party will do this 
and I'm afraid not much more, 11% for Labour. That's against 38% for the Greens. So there is a lot of ground for us to make up. I think Labour should rescue the national food strategy uh, from conservative hostility, emphasising the importance of access for all to healthy food, supporting by, supported by an environmentally sound domestic farming industry. Good food should not be the preserve of the rich. I think Labour should build on its strong commitment to green jobs and on carbon to back and implement the 30 by 30 legal commitment to improve 30% of land for nature by 2030. Uh, the Conservatives have effectively abandoned this target. And I think Labour should renew its historic place as the creator of national parks by implementing the 2019 Glover Review on protected landscapes, ensuring that they do more for nature and more for people. And now this was in, included in the last Labour manifesto, but has stalled, uh, as we know, uh, under Conservative ministers. So let me just say this to you all in conclusion. The perception that politicians who neither represent nor understand the countryside or coastal towns, uh, the perception that we just want to impose or assert control and that we fail to listen, has, I think, added to a sense um, in Britain of them and us. And this is why I welcome your conference today and why I want to hear back uh, from you this morning, because, you know, you are embracing the idea of a common purpose and th that what unites us in caring about the countryside and the coast is more important than what might divide us. That everyone has a part to play in, in this crucial national debate. That good policy solutions for food or nature or water and sewage or health will best be reached by discussion and agreement not by conflict. We're talking about parts of the country that are truly national assets. And so it should be something, you know, whose future uh, matters to us all. Point of unity, in other words, not of not division. So I hope the next Labour government will resist single issue agendas and shape an optimistic, a positive, inclusive agenda, both for the coastal towns and the importance both of regenerating them and protecting them from environmental damage and pollution, as well as for the countryside. An agenda about better food, restoring nature, opening access to people in cities who, who do not think the countryside is for them necessarily now, and creating new opportunities for people to visit and stay or even resettle in our coastal towns. Now, that's the spirit uh, in which my grandfather and his generation of labor approach this cause uh, after, uh, after the war. And it was based on a simple understanding that the countryside and our coastal towns are a national asset. They're held in trust by their present owners, but ultimately belong to us all. That we all, therefore, have a responsibility to care for them and nurture them and re-empower them, giving real voice and meaning uh, to that slogan, taking back control, and that a national government must speak for them. Just remember this, as I always have said, Labour is a national party or it is nothing. So let's remember that as we plan for and convincingly win the next election. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you ever so much, uh, Peter, for that. And you can see there's lo lots of applause. Can't hear it because of the strange modern world that we live in. Um, but I'm sure people are clapping loudly at home. And it was fantastic um, to hear um, your views put in a historical context, but also with that firm uh, focus on the future. Um, so we've had lots of uh, questions um, put in the chat. Uh, we've got just under um, 15 minutes. Um, so I'm going to put three broad questions to you um, that um, have come from various questions. Um, the first one is about rural crime. 
Um, many of our members think that it's a growing problem um, in the countryside. Um, and what would be a strong message, do you think, for the Labour Party to have going into the general election? So people like Margaret and Michael have been asking about that in the chat. Um, the second theme is around the green belt. Um, I can see Deborah's been raising that. Um, it also comes up, I find, on the doorstep in mid Bedfordshire. Um, people saying that Labour wants to concrete all over um, the countryside and are upset about it. But we also have the issue um, whereby some of our towns and cities can feel a little bit strangled by the green belt um, and feel the need to build uh, good quality housing uh, nearby. And then the third one is an organisational question uh, from people like Lucy, who say that the constituencies we're talking about are really huge. Um, do you have any top tips for um, campaigning in places that are really, really big? So back over to you. I'm afraid that you've got to really um, get fit, keep fit and put in the hours. It's a very, very hard slog because whilst I'm, you know, a huge advocate of digital campaigning, um, that personal contact, that relationship, um, uh, you know, there's really nothing to substitute for it. I mean, people are looking at you, looking into your eyes, listening to the tone of voice, working out whether you've got empathy as a candidate or as a party, uh, whether you get it. And that's much more easily done and achieved through human contact uh, than it, it is digitally, uh, quite honestly. Although having listened to some of the candidates uh, just now, my word, you know, you, you, you are radiating uh, 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 energy and empathy uh, virtually in a way that uh, you know I commend you for. Um, um, but you know, you, you've got to look to the digital uh as whether as well as to the sort of hard leather you know pounding of of streets and lanes on the green belt um nobody is proposing to sort of concrete over the green belt and i thought that what Keir said on this was right it was his words were carefully chosen but you know a green belt you know is not something that is, as it were, sort of frozen in aspic. You know, there, there are, you know, <laughs> there is a certain evolution, um, you know, around the edges in some respects. But, you know, let me make a, a wider point about planning. This is a, this is a really, really difficult issue for Labour. It's difficult. Look at what it's done to the Tories. I mean, I applaud uh, what our government did after the war in the 1947 Town and Country Planning Act, as I've said. Um, it was a huge priority. Um, but you know, in essence, that act and framework that set the template for our planning system in this country hasn't fundamentally changed since 1947 that social needs have, areas have changed, public demands have changed. And there is, I'm afraid, whilst a need uh, to resist the, you know, as I've said, the predations of, uh, you know, commercial uh, developers, there is also a need to resist uh, nimbyism. Those, those often in an older generation who have, uh, a very comfortable life, who have a lot of resources devoted to them because of their age, uh, both in respect of health and the operation of our health service, but which has produced an imbalance between the older and younger generations in this country. Now, this is a wider and bigger uh, discussion, but I'm increasingly feeling, just looking at the state of the country and reflecting on Labour's approach and policies, just as we need very radical turns of the policy dial to rebalance the country between North and South, we also need some very creative and imagin imaginative policy solutions 
to rebalancing uh, the interests and prospects of the older and younger generations. And I think that's what we have to just take more into account in, uh, in, in our approach to uh, planning. On rural crime, look, you could say this of a lot of public services and indeed private commercial retail services, everyone's going digital. And of course, um, the new digital economy and society has been, is being a lifesaver uh, uh, for many people, but it's also undermining uh, people's communities. If you take everything online and you lift service and benefits, uh, true, you, you improve, you strengthen services and benefits in many ways, but you also are in danger of reducing cohesion, safety, and agglomeration of services in, in, in a community. Uh, and that goes for the police service and fighting crime as it does for any other. So um, I'm, I'm worried about the sense of isolation and lack of security and safety people feel uh, by the sort of shrinking of visible uh, police services uh, and availability. Um, and I think that we've got to um, uh, make sure uh, that, you know, in the, in the guise of modernization or digitalization, uh, we don't see a retreat of common universal standards of service uh, in, in respect of all our um, public services, but inclusive, including the police and the crime fighting services as, as well. Fantastic. Uh, thank you um, ever so much. Um, there's lots more questions coming in. So um, <laughs> the next, uh, I've got another um, three uh, themes that have come out um, of um, the chat so far. The first one is about transport um, and rural transport, uh, which people like Alex and Paul have been making comments about. Obviously, um, much uh, less public transport um, in many of our rural and coastal areas. And we've also now got uh, the Tories talking about uh, the war on motorists. Um, how do we make sure that we've got a, a rural and coastal transport policy uh, that talks to Labour voters? The second is about energy policy. Um, many of the people who uh, live in more rural areas um, have, for example, oil um, boilers. Um, perhaps we should be doing something about breaking up the monopoly of boiler juice, um, something that often comes up in a Labour Coast and Country uh, meeting. Um, what, what would you uh, suggest would be a good thing for the Labour Party uh, to be talking about um, in terms of that? Um, and then thirdly, Margaret makes the point that Labour needs to know that those, those of us who live in the countryside are not weird. Um, how do we make sure um, that um, people understand that um, Labour voters and, and voters generally who live in the countryside and coastal communities are often very similar um, to people who live in urban uh, communities as well? And I suppose I would add to that, how do we get the, the Labour Party to use the language um, of those areas? Um, I personally had a complete failure at the National Policy Forum in trying to get them to insert um, the words market towns and, and was told, well, you've already got towns. Why do you need market towns as well? And try to explain that they're very different. And that's how people um, talk about things uh, was a, a complicated thing uh, to get across um, to some of, some of the front bench. Um, so what would you do about the challenges of those? Thanks. Yeah. I mean, I live near uh, Pusey. I wouldn't describe it as a market town. I live a little further away from Marlborough, which most certainly is a market town. They're not the same. Um, and uh, <laughs> I can imagine the battle at the National Policy Forum talking to some... Anyway, don't, don't get me going. Um, look... Uh, uh, people who live outside cities are not weird. Actually, I got a very weird MP here in uh, Wiltshire Devizes, so I won't go there. But I tell you something: when I when I first came here, I found only three people who were Labour voters. I mean, I have to say, there are not very many people who live here. But you know, next door to me is the farmer and his wife, definitely lifelong Labour. Uh, one other person down the road 
who I go for walks with. Um, a lot now of other people who I meet just say to me, we're never going to vote Tory. We're not going to vote for the local guy because we think he's weird. There's Tory MP, no names, no back drill. Um, but we, but, but we're just not sure Labour is for us. It, it's a sort of, most people remember, by the way, a brilliant Labour candidate we had fighting Danny Kruger at the last election. A lot of people uh, liked her a lot. I, uh, I've been trying to find out what's happened to her and who, who might be the next one. I think the, the, this guy could be defeated. But we've got to make an effort. You know, we. I said to uh, people in, in London, you know, you're just, you just don't see these constituencies you know, for their potential, for what they are. You don't realise, you know, the shift in thinking and electoral attitudes that is taking place. People are looking for a non-Tory to vote for here. They're fed to the back teeth with the government. They're like everyone else in the country. They see the chaos, they see the self-interest and the self-indulgence, they see the lies, uh, they see the complete absence of any sort of vision or plan uh, for the country. And they want something quite different, but they also want to know who they're voting for. So please get on and select your candidate. Now, on energy, let me make, I'm not an expert on sort of oil juice or whatever it was you said. I want to make a wider point about the energy transition. We in the Labour Party reflect the overwhelming majority sentiment in this country, which is completely committed to decarbonising uh, our economy and society. People don't need to be persuading anymore about the need, the challenge, the objectives and the targets, but they're worried about the affordability. They're worried that suddenly they're going to be forced the year after next to buy new cars and they can't afford them. Nobody's asking them to, forcing them to buy new cars. What we're saying is that by 2030, you know, where people do want to uh, 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 buy new cars, the cars have got to be uh, uh, decarbonized and the, and the motor manufacturers have, have got to do the switch, which they are very keen, by the way, to do. And in some cases are disappointed and bemused uh, by the moving of the goalposts by Sunak uh, uh, recently. I'd say that for home heating, the what people see as a sort of threat uh, and a real source of anxiety is greater even than for cars, much greater uh, for home heating than for cars. And we've got to be realistic uh, uh, about this. You know, to change your home heating um, is, is a radical thing uh, for many people. It's expensive. People are anxious about it. Uh, we've got to explain. We've got to sort of go with the grain of, of uh, people's fears and thinking and make sure that they uh, are helped where need be financially uh, to make those uh, changes. We've got to speak much more as pragmatists and practicalists than evangelists and missionaries. On transport, God, how fundamental um, it is. I'm not going to touch on HS2. Um, but uh, all I would say is that the last Labour government's earliest judgment and decision about high-speed rail was to place the priority on regional and local rail networks integrated with bus services rather than uh, a single high-speed rail going, going from London right up through Birmingham, Manchester to Leeds and York, etc. Now, for all sorts of reasons, that judgment was changed, uh, first by us uh, and then, of course, as we know, by the Conservatives. And in my view, there was too strong a political uh, influence uh, over that early commitment to HS2 and not sufficiently an economic one and not sufficiently 
an attention to local and regional needs and what committing such resource to HS2 would mean for the rest of the rail network. It, 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 I'm afraid I just don't think it was thought through. However, it's gone ahead. Uh, we have now, to all intents and purposes, London to Birmingham, well, Oak Common at any rate, to Birmingham, and possibly not to uh, Manchester uh, uh, yet. Complex issues. In my view, though, as a broad rule of thumb, I would go regional and local, and certainly speaking as a former Northern Member of Parliament, uh, I would go for um, coast to coast services uh, before I go for you know, North to London high speed services. That's my broad rule of uh, uh, thumb. Um, but let's be honest, a minority of people are going to use uh, rail. A greater number of people need to rely on bus services. Uh, and we've got to uh, uh, look uh, to their needs. And of course, we're not declaring war on the motorists. I don't know whether you heard on the Today programme the other day, um, a debate between uh, a Conservative Cornwall chair of a council transportation or planning committee, I can't remember, uh, really advocating uh, sensible uh, um, uh, uh, traffic management and speed uh, policies in Cornwall as against a, another Tory uh, uh, from London who was trying to sort of create divisions and stir up uh, uh, p divide and stir up people against each other over uh, uh, over 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 tra traffic schemes. I must say, I thought the the Cornwall Tory really came out strongly uh, and and won the argument uh, over the London motorist culture warrior. Fantastic. All right. Well, thank, thank you ever so much. That brings us uh, now to uh, the end um, of our time. It's been really um, inspiring hearing from you. Um, I'm sure if you have a look in, in the chat, you can see what kind of a debate um, you've sparked and to have somebody talking so eloquently. Um, about the issues that we face um, in rural and coastal communities has been uh, fantastic um, for Labour Coast and Country. Uh, so can everyone um, give uh, Peter Mandelson another round of applause, please? Fantastic. Thank you ever so much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. It's been great to be with you. Um, a real pleasure for me. Thanks a lot.